Gretchen, thanks so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. Uh, tell me about your business. Tell me where you guys are located, website address, Instagram, social media, all the good stuff. All the good things. So uh, my business is Rocket Science Events, and we are based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but we do events nationwide, sometimes some international stuff, but mostly domestic destinations. And the website is rocketscience.events. And same Instagram handle, rocketscience.events. You can find me on Twitter. Not too many event pros on Twitter, I, I don't find, but um, yeah. at rocketsciencewe on Twitter and rocketsciencewe on Facebook. It's amazing what a decade of business does, like when you're thinking about like what social media platforms you use. You know, yeah. Facebook used to be the first one you'd lead with. and Instagram wasn't even around. So yeah, having to think about my Facebook you know, <laughs> for a second. <laughs> yeah, it seems like most of them pros, I mean, to me, I don't know, they're hanging out on Instagram and Pinterest uh, for the yeah. most part. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, every though, even though like everybody seems to have a Facebook account and they're on there, I don't really hear people talking about Facebook that much anymore. It's like, you know, check me out on Instagram or whatever, right? It's yeah. like, okay. Well, I think with events being such a visual art form that yep. that's really such a great tool for us to use also same with pinterest i'm yep. actually seeing a ton of traction now i you know i have a little bit of downtime now with how thing, things are going mm -hmm. um and so i've been trying to really ramp up my pinterest and my linkedin and it's amazing the linkedin traffic that i'm getting too so uh, that's one place where i really think that event professionals should focus on especially if they have a little bit of free time because they're there are leads coming in, people are interacting with the content that I'm putting out there. Um, and that's a place that I have not spent a lot of time, but now I'm seeing a pretty interesting like increase in leads and, and stuff from LinkedIn. So. Wow. Uh, like people asking for, for you to do events for them and stuff. Uh, I've gotten a lot of followers and also I've gotten a lot of people to my website and I've got a corporate planner who reached out via LinkedIn about doing a virtual. She had questions on virtual events. So, uh, you know, right now with how the landscape is for live events, I think it's, I think it's going to be a while before we start yeah. seeing the corporate uh, the company companies coming back and, and asking to produce those types of events. But, you know, if I can become a thought leader in the industry on that platform that specifically yeah. targets those, those planners and that they're seeking out my resources, I think when we do get back to events as normal, that might yeah. be uh, one thing that keeps me top of mind with them. Yeah, that's good. That's a good. Uh, that's actually a really good point. So, um, uh, so why rocket science uh, seems yeah. <laughs> seems like an interesting name. Where did you come up with that? What was the thought behind that? I had, um, it's funny, I was actually tagged in the space launch. Uh, somebody tagged me on Instagram in the, the, the recent space launch, the rocket that went up. I was like, <laughs> I didn't have anything to do with that. But, yeah, um, yeah. and my Google Analytics, it's really funny to see the search terms. If people are searching rocket scientists, um, they get a wedding website. <laughs> so, but, um, yeah. I actually worked for a different company before launching Rocket Science in 2010, and I was doing event planning and wedding planning, and I had a private home event. So in Minnesota, we have a lot of lakes. Uh, yep. Wisconsin's the cheese, Minnesota's the lakes, <laughs> and a lot of people have homes and cabins on the lake. So we were doing a, a tented wedding on the lake, very logistically challenging, and I had a big team that day, but one of my assistants called in sick. So I called my best friend who is a environmental engineer, not a planner, never. She's, she got married, but you know, she didn't have like a huge wedding either. And so I called her, I'm like, listen, I just need a body. Like, you know, I need somebody yeah. to help with directing the cars and the parking and the valet and the fireworks and blah, blah, blah. So I said, can you come help me just for the day? And so she said, sure. So she shows up and I, you know, I give her her list of things to do and she comes back about an hour later and she's like, I've done all of these things. Plus the cake fell down. 
but I've got a replacement cake on the way and it's all good. And the look <laughs> on my face must have been, I don't know, shock, awe, not quite sure, but she looks at me and she said, what's wrong? And I said, well, you know, the list that I gave you was a lot of stuff. And then the cake fell down and she's like, yeah. <laughs> No big deal. <laughs> no big deal. And I was like, and you came up with a solution? And she said, yeah, I, this is what we're doing. And I said, okay, great. And she said, it's not rocket science. <laughs> so from then on, I said to her, I said, listen, if I ever start my own company, that's what I'm going to call it because it isn't, but it is, you know, yeah. anyone yeah, yeah. who does events know, you know, this is like logistics and the the problem solving skills that you need and yep. so so yeah that was probably two years before I launched my my company um, and she actually now works for me so oh wow that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> yeah you I mean it is you're right I mean it is and you know it isn't like you know launching a rocket which is a pretty significant feat but the logistics of timing and making sure that everything goes off. I mean, it's, it's like a one-time deal, right? It's like, yes. you know, it either blows up or it's, you know, it goes off without a hitch. Right. And so, yep. uh, yeah, that's, that's great. That's a, yes. that's a great story. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, I think it's one of the best decisions I've made for my business because a lot of people name, especially when they're a solo entrepreneur, they name their company after themselves. Yep. And so I, from the get go wanted to have a bigger team. That's changed since I launched my company, but uh, you know, I was thinking that it would be better to have a name that wasn't my name, yeah. and to grow the the team, and also if I ever wanted to sell it. And I think, like, I wasn't. I was thinking about that a little bit when I started it. I also just thought it was pretty funny and clever. Yeah. But that yeah. has been like the biggest, one of the biggest and best decisions that I've made because I don't need business cards. I'm like my company is rocket science events. Like nobody forgets that, you know, yeah. they're not like, Oh, Gretchen Culver soirees or something like that, you know? So yeah, no, it was like, it was good. a good choice. Yeah, that's good. You know, um, I, I think other business owners don't really think about that either. Right. Like, um, you know, and especially the fact that it's an event business, you know, and you, even though you'd probably do mostly weddings in general, uh, by net, by not adding, like I've had a couple planners tell me, I wish I wouldn't have put weddings in the name of my business, right? Because, yeah. you know, later when they're trying to do other stuff, nobody wants, you know, if they're looking for other things, they're just, you know, they don't qualify because it's, oh, well, you just do weddings. And it's just, just like, you know, you're automatically just off the list, totally. you know? So, yeah, that's well, great. I dropped the weddings. It used to be rocket science weddings and events, which is why my Facebook handle is W-E, because that's weddings and events. But I got gotcha. you. About maybe three or four years ago, I did a rebrand, uh, took out the weddings Smart. and started to put more corporate work and started to do more nonprofit stuff to get kind of, cause you're right. I mean, if you want to go into that market at all, like they don't want to see weddings, nope. even though planning a wedding is by far harder than planning a nonprofit gala. Like they, they don't understand the connection, right? They don't right. see how those skills are transferable. So that was one thing that, um, that I learned very quickly is that if I want to do anything besides weddings, I need to get, I need to dial down the wedding. Yeah. And so I did drop it from, I did drop it from the name, but there's still a few remnants. Yeah. Also, science weddings and events.com is a very long yeah. uh, web address too. So it was helpful yeah. to shorten it. But, but it also gives you some diversity as a business, right? You don't have to uh, just focus on weddings. You can do other stuff. And as a company, uh, when weddings are down and wedding season is down, there might be some other events that are up, you know, and that kind of balances out your entire year versus just focusing on wedding season. Um, yes, totally. Especially in Minnesota. Wedding season is June through October. That's it. Nothing happens in the wintertime. Yeah, so, there's a few, but not much. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it quiets down. Yeah, which is, it's nice because the events aren't happening, but then it's engagement season. So you're now doing all of the sales and the, yeah. the portfolio refresh and then the initial planning stages of the events that you're executing in the summer. So yep. it's just a different kind of busy. Totally. Yeah. Got it. Uh, so let's talk about 
couples getting married and uh let's you know so for you guys uh are most of your couples coming through social media uh, referrals that you get from other people what, is, what what's happening with you today how's that working i feel like we're a little bit unique we have a very diverse um client roster i would say um we have people who are all over the country most of our couples are not from or they're not currently living in minnesota so either one of them grew up here or their yeah. family is here but they're usually actually almost entirely on the east coast i have a couple of west coast people um but they're we're planning long distance gotcha. and so and we're planning all different types of, you know, we're planning the wedding, but we're planning a rehearsal dinner. We're planning morning after brunch. We're planning the, the henna party, that sort of thing. So um, we're typically looking at a whole weekend's worth of stuff versus just like one event on the wedding day. Mm -hmm. um, and because most people don't live here, they're finding me, I think it's very different. Like they're all finding me through the internet. So as most I think most businesses are more referral based and word of mouth. Nine out of my 10 leads comes from a Google search. Nice. Uh, so I've started to actually dive deeper into SEO to focus on actually getting in front of the people who are planning a wedding here, but aren't located here. Uh, just because that seems to be a, the clientele that's really, they like what rocket science does. And then we also have really great relationships with venues. So that's, you know, that, that still is the highest up in the, the planning food chain. You know, it's one of the first things that the, that couples do. And I actually have found, this has been a big change over the years. When I started in 2010, people were coming to the planner at the very beginning. Right now I find that they've booked their venue. They might've even booked their photographer. You know, they've done a lot of planning before they, come to the planner and but they still don't like they're still hiring me for full planning yeah. um so i found that that venue relationship is really key especially as more and more venues have require they require couples to have planners yep. uh, dress shops are a really great source of referrals and photographers i think social media has entirely disrupted the the ecosystem of weddings and so people are following photographers before they are even engaged and they're like, I, you know, I got to have that photographer. And so mm -hmm. then they book the photographer and then, then they come to me. So that referral piece is important, but it's definitely for me, internet search. I haven't actually had a lot of traffic come from Instagram or Facebook, but I know that people go there before yeah. they go to my website or before yeah. they fill out my contact form. Yeah. I actually had one client say, I, I um, read all of your tweets before I reached out. So it's an important piece of the puzzle, but that's not, I think, where the initial lead is. Yeah, from. yeah, that's true because they're just looking, you know, they're, they're just kind of like scoping things out. Uh, I interviewed a bride early on in the process. She said she sourced all her vendors, even though she didn't probably go directly to them through Instagram, but she said she sourced most everything that she was planning through Instagram just by looking at hashtags and looking at, you know, the area that they wanted to get married. And so I thought that was very interesting that they were looking there first and kind of just getting ideas and figuring out what they wanted. And then, you know, it's probably to Google and searching for so-and-so, right? Boom. Mm -hmm. right? Like, yes. You know, kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, I think it's, yep. it's super important that you actually are, are everywhere. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's unfortunate that you have to do it as a business, but you have to be everywhere. I know. And now like the conversations in my group of planners is like, do we have to get on TikTok? Yeah, I know. I mean, you, well, you think about it, right? Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, I'm sure you're probably familiar with Gary V, um, mm -hmm. Gary Vaynerchuk. So, uh, you know, just listening to some of the stories that he talks about in his book, Crushing It Around the TikTok thing, um, like with the, uh, the person that's doing, you know, the pediatric dentist. And I'm like, like, look, they're building a whole business using this platform that's focused towards younger, gener you know, younger crowd of people. And it's like, wow, that's very interesting that they, you know, that, that she has been able to do that 
and build her business and grow it, right? Um, plus open up uh, tons of other opportunities for her. But yeah, is that the next thing we all need to be doing now? <laughs> I better brush up on my dance moves. I know, right? Something, <laughs> uh, you know, or just figure out what other people are doing because, you know, I don't know. Does it make sense? Because I've thought about it too. Is a, I'm a research company, right? So it's li it's literally much, much different than what, what you guys are doing. And so I'm, I'm, I look at that and I go, what do I do with numbers, right? I mean, people are like, yeah, forget the numbers. I just so show me the pictures, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, totally. yeah, I get it. Um, so what's the process when couples contact you? What happens? Like, so they contact you, email or whatever, call you. What's that process look like? One of the best things that I did for my business a few years ago was really streamline my inquiry process because I was finding that I was talking to a lot of unqualified leads and I was spending a lot of time with the education piece yeah. and then ultimately, you know, spending two, three, four hours maybe prior to them booking and then giving them all this information and then they were going elsewhere. So that was pretty frustrating for me. So I thought, okay, this, I got to switch my system. So I have streamlined it a lot. So I don't put any pricing on my website. I would never get a lead if I did. So <laughs> I think that as, um, you know, somebody who is probably in the top tier of like price points in my market. Like it just, people aren't booking me because right. I'm a great price. So I don't think that's what they're looking for when they come to my website. They're looking for more information on what I do and how I do it. And I make everyone fill out a contact form no matter what, because most everyone comes from like internet search. It, yeah. That's I, no one ever calls me. So, and if somebody happens to send me an email and they said, oh, I got your email from this venue. I'll say, please fill out my contact form. So my contact form is on my website and it's, uh, it's got a lot of qualifying steps in it. it you know, there's, do you make it, how long do you make it before people don't want to actually fill it out? But for, for me, I really went through what are like the, the absolute things that I need to know before I would want to talk on the phone or take the next step with somebody. So my content that's, good. that's actually really good um has like what's your budget and there's money questions involved you know because i yes th there is always wiggle room i mean this is wedding like yeah, yeah, budget yeah. 101 like yeah. someone might think they're gonna spend 50 and they end up spending 150 but very yeah. rarely do people go from 20,000 to 50,000 that's right so getting some of those budget questions dealt with right away so then i can either say yep like, let's continue the conversation or no, like, let me refer you to somebody else. And so then once that email comes in, I don't have any canned response. I basically look at their form and write them a personal email and I do it immediately. Like I have a very hard time with boundaries. So <laughs> you know, I'm on my email often. And so if someone writes me on a Sunday, I'll probably get back to them because I've heard so much from uh, potential clients and the clients that have hired me, like, thank you so much for getting back to me so yeah. quickly, or yeah. thank you for getting back to me at all, which blows my mind that people wouldn't return an inquiry. But um, so they fill out that form and then I'll send them an email. And if it seems like a good match, what I, but what I say is like the next step would be for us to hop on a call and I used to do a lot of in-person meetings, but then my clientele moved to be more out of state. And then I was also trying to streamline my process and I got rid of my office, which was one of the best decisions I ever made. And so if we set up a call time, there's another form that they have to fill out before I will even get on the phone with them. So if they don't fill out the, like they have to fill out that form before we set up a time to talk because that form goes a little bit deeper into budget and it asks yeah. them, if they're comfortable with a per person minimum investment of X amount of dollars. And then, so they have to answer, yes, I'm looking forward to talking more or no, not at this time. Yeah. So it's kind of a two check system. So That's like by great. the time we get on that call, they should have a pretty good understanding of what they're going to be spending if they're hiring me without actually knowing how much I cost. And then after that call is when I'll send them a custom proposal. 
and that's where I will tailor the proposal. I have a template and then I just like tailor it to, I work a lot at the same venues or private homes. So I'll kind of make it look similar to maybe the aesthetic that they're wanting or it showcases pictures from their venue and it has the package, well, package is a taboo term. It has the yeah. details of the services I'm offering. Yeah. And then it, that, and then that's what I'll send them. It's very rare that I get to a point of a proposal um, without then converting them to a client. So I'm not talking to a lot of people either. I mean, I, before the pandemic was getting a handful of leads per month. So I am not a volume based business, uh, but I do want to just make sure that my time is spent well. And that system yeah. that I implemented has, oh my gosh, it's, it's weeded out the, the clients that I don't have any red flag clients anymore either, you know? So, um, awesome. I don't have a lot of tire kickers, which yeah. is, which is where I was feeling really frustrated, you know, yeah. spending a lot of time and then them ghosting me. So yeah, I, I um, think that, that call happens is usually like an yeah. hour. So I'm That's fine cool. with investing an hour of my time on the phone with somebody after they've done that process. So after they've met the minimum qualifications yep. and mm -hmm. invested some time in actually doing it. The other part of that is like having them fill those things out is them investing time and actually giving you some information because uh, you know, otherwise it's like, here's my date. Are you available? How much do you cost? Here's my date. Are you available? How much do you cost? Right. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, that's good. I'm glad that you did that. That's really a, um, that's probably been a huge relief <laughs> off of your, you know, like, great. I don't have to spend three or four hours trying to pull these people in, wasting all this time dealing with, yep. you or know, going, I've been burned too many times, you know, you show yeah. up for that meeting and then it's like, okay, I was just spent. So, and it's your ideas, right? Like, so when I'm doing that phone call, I like to talk to people about like, I love designing and thinking about creative ways. And I think giving them a little taste of what I can do is a great sales tool. For That's me, right. You know? Absolutely. Uh, so I don't want to give you a lot of ideas if you are just going to not hire me to be, to begin with, if you're just shopping around on price. Um, and by the end of that uh, inquiry process, you know, it's pretty clear what my value is to them. And it, it's, it starts the relationship on a much more solid yeah. foot too, I think. That's a great um, I also way. Also, ask them how many planners that they're interviewing, which is a really, um, that's been really eye-opening too, uh, and that can kind of direct your conversation as well, you know. And if they're interviewing more than one, I like to ask them if they've talked to anyone before they've talked to me, because being the first is different than being the second or third interview. Yeah. Can, um, so yeah. Yeah. It's been a good. It's been a good change to the business for sure, and I've also been able to not thing take things so personally you yeah. know it's not like oh they're rejecting me as a person they don't like me you know it's like no this is a business this is what i do you want it you'll pay for it great if not like no love lost you know like yeah. there's somebody else that's going to be a good fit for you that's great so that's done two things for you one release your time secondly made you feel better about yourself by not being rejected or ghosted by a client because yes. right? i gotta imagine that I mean, it does. It probably, you know, it, it comes back at you like, ah, why don't they like me? Why don't they want me? You know, yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, how long does the process usually take? Like after you, um, I mean, let's say someone books with you, they go through the process. How much time do you generally need to spend doing what you need to do? Is there anything else they need to do after that? Or you pretty much take care of it from there? Um, and then they meet you guys on, I mean, meet you on the day of, or how, I mean, what does that process look like? It varies a little bit per client, but most of my clients, whether they're local or not are busy. They have jobs, they have other things that they want to do. Most people, most of my clients want to have a wedding, but they really don't want to do any of the work. Like they really, they're like, some of them are getting married because they know their parents want them to have a big wedding or some of them are, you know, just really wanting to throw out an epic party, but like have no idea how to do it. And they know like, just leave it to the professionals. So yeah. I tell my clients like they can be as much or as little involved in the planning process as they want. 
I would, and once they hire me, the majority of my clients are hiring me for planning, design, and then we do production and house of floral and some other stuff. So I'm kind of like their main point of contact and I'm in, I'm, I, like I said, I have no boundaries. So I'm like, you can text yeah. me, like, you know, however it works well to plan. Typically, because I do have a lot of out-of-town people, we're doing a lot of stuff, um, well, Zoom, yeah, or FaceTime, mm -hmm. or we're planning a couple of key meetings throughout the planning process, you know, where they're going to come to Minnesota, and that's when we're going to do tastings and gotcha. uh, hair and makeup trial, that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. I have an online planning software that I use, so everyone can be on that, and we can be planning from across the country, and it works just fine. Um, technology has really helped with yeah. this planning process. <laughs> um, I find most people want to do the food part of it. I have a lot of foodies. I think people who really love to eat that are my clients. I think that's, uh, I'm always a huge portion of my clients' budget is going to, to catering and Good to food, the bar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then the design process is really fun uh, where we kind of do we do like a discovery meeting and then I put together a really um, comprehensive de design deck for them. And we do what I call like the reveal party. And so, you know, sometimes it has to be done on zoom. Usually I like to do that in person and have champagne and that sort of thing. Nice. Uh, but we're doing, you know, we're not doing a lot of in, in person meetings because it just doesn't need to happen. So yeah, it doesn't anymore. Yeah. The, it really doesn't. And you know, like I can go to the venue and take a couple pictures or, make a video and text it to them and that answers their question. So I found that like my clients are happy to like turn the reins over. And I basically said like, if I need something from you, I'll reach out, but otherwise just think, know that things are going well and the process is going as That's should good. be. And they're like, yeah, okay. Yeah, great. Great. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Let's switch gears a little bit, talk about business side of things, uh, even though we've talked about it the whole time. But <laughs> uh, what would you say, though, uh, for you maybe over the past couple of years? I know you mentioned like changing your qualification process, uh, the name and things like that. But what else has worked for you? That's, what else has been working well for you maybe over the past two years, would you say? I would say that those changes that we talked about have probably been the biggest shifts. And then I would also say that my wedding portfolio is great. And what's really been beneficial the last few years is networking to create those new relationships because I want to do more. I love weddings, love them. They're great. Um, but I want to do different things creatively, yeah. which corporate and nonprofit work lets you do. It's just a different kind of party, you know, yeah. it's a different kind of event. It's a different kind of experience. Um, I'm really interested in event technology and virtual reality and holograms and all that stuff and p weddings, meh, yeah. you know, that's, that's not what they're looking for. So, um, I've really been focusing on being a part of organizations like Ilea, I was just, I'm actually our past president, our immediate past president. So that's been really a focus of mine to create those connections and to diversify my network of people. Um, Cause the wedding industry here is pretty insulated. You know, it's kind of a, it's a smaller, pretty yeah. tight knit group. Um, and so then just being able to kind of reach out, Ilea has always been a great, I, I joined almost as soon as I started my company and then have been involved in, in, various elements but that's been huge for me and that's how i've been making those connections and then getting my foot in the door with various organizations that i would want to work with um and then you know minneapolis has a ton of fortune 500 companies including yeah. you know target and best buy and that and so then that's where i've been going to linkedin and looking at the people who plan the events there and making connections that way and diversifying yeah. my network there so I'm hoping it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a long play, but I'm hoping that those relationships are going to yield yeah. new, exciting business for me. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, what would you say uh, outside of COVID-19, what is, what's been your kind of your biggest challenges maybe over the past year or so? That's the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Building relationships and doing something else. 
Yeah, you know, I think the the yeah, I, I honestly it's I am I am you know, we take eight wedding clients a year. So we don't have a lot of we have a lot of availability, but also not a lot of availability, if that makes any sense. So, you know, I, because I'm not getting, you know, people aren't just kicking down the door with leads, you know, it's becoming, I just need to make sure that I can sustain the business, you know, and make sure yeah. that like, um, you know, making sure my expenses are where they need to be. Yeah. Uh, oh, one thing I will say about three years ago, or maybe four four years ago. I can't remember it. Time is, I know crazy. Uh, <laughs> um, but I hired a bookkeeper. I don't need a bookkeeper, but I learned that I don't like to do bookkeeping. So I hired a bookkeeper and that changed my life. Like I have four part-time employees and then I have, a, I utilize a lot of independent contractors. Yeah. I have a payment processing company that handles my payroll. I, don't need that. You know what I mean? Like as a company as small as mine, like there's weeks that I'm not running a payroll, but like I was working, um, with a wonderful, uh, coach in the industry. And she was like, if you don't like to do it, like don't do it. Right. Yep. Yep. And you're not good at it. And it just drains you. So I hired a bookkeeper. Um, I have QuickBooks online. I have a great tax guy and, you know, and I have all these things. So, so that part of my business is almost on autopilot and my bookkeeper got me doing um cash flow so every month we have a cash flow meeting so i think this is really important for small businesses especially if you're creative and you you don't want to you're not thinking about you don't want to think about money and you know yeah. but <laughs> what's helpful for me is having done that and gotten into that practice like we're i'm set for this i you know like wasn't expecting a pandemic but like knowing what my cash flow is through June of 2021, I can feel more comfortable, more confident, more prepared. Yeah. Like my, I'm not going out of business. I'm changing the way I do business, yeah. you know, and I'm, I'm looking at things and, you know, trimming hours and eat, so all these other things. But like, that was, that I think has been key for me not to totally just freak out right now. You know, yeah. I lost a huge corporate client that was supposed to be my entire year you know, okay. So now we have our cash flow meeting and we're like, okay, we got to take money out of every single one of those months. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. What are we going to do now? So, um, so that's been, a, that's been a huge help. And I didn't, I wish I'd have done that from the beginning of my business, but, um, you know, especially when you're small and you're starting, you're like, I can do everything. And then you realize I can do everything, <laughs> but not well, you know, <laughs> or I can't sleep because I got to do everything. <laughs> yes. Or I actually don't want to do everything. There are yeah. things I really don't want to do. Um, yeah. so I think the other challenges too is, uh, competing in a very, this is what, this is what old people like me complain about, um, is like competing in the social media market where you have a lot of people doing for weddings specifically styled shoots. Yeah. Um, where you have a hard time discerning who is an actual quality experienced event professional versus who can make a pretty photo and put it on Instagram. So I think that that's a, a challenge for couples looking to hire people. Yeah, I was going to say, if you're challenged with it, you got to imagine they're really challenged with it as well. Well, and I think with weddings, they're only doing it once. They haven't done it before. So they don't even know what questions to ask. That's right. And they don't get to do it over again. So if their vendor team is terrible, it's just going to be a terrible memory for them for the rest of their life. And so that's really hard for me is just trying to adapt to the social media landscape and also how to make sure to position myself as a company that has, you know, actual experience and has done hundreds of events and, you know, has. Yeah. Uh, you know, now I have pandemic training under my belt, you know? So, yeah. um, that's, I think been the biggest challenge is really trying to stay relevant and make the value of my brand understood in a, in a ecosystem that is very loud and crowded. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Uh, you mentioned that, um, you would go back and hire uh, a bookkeeper in the beginning. So I was going to ask you next question was, what would you do five years ago or four years ago 
if you had to, you know, if, what would you tell yourself then, right? Um, outside the bookkeeper, is there anything else you would tell yourself then, four or five years ago? I would say the financial piece is a little, yeah, that I, I would say to myself, I would say to myself, do the things that you love to do and let other people do the rest. You are a great business owner, even if you don't have your hands on every single aspect of the business. I am a very like, I like to be in control, which is why I own my own business. <laughs> and, um, and so I think it's sometimes hard to trust people and let them in, especially when your livelihood depends on it, not just being a friend or something like that. That's right, but yeah. had I been more willing to trust, to outsource, to build some of those relationships, I think I would have been happier, quicker. I, that makes it sound like I'm not happy, but you know, I think I would have, no, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Felt exactly more comfortable or confident or, you know, yeah. and also had the ability to grow more quickly. I think mm -hmm. by not having some of those key um, people to help me, that's, I've had to kind of stay in a slower growth trajectory um, and haven't, you know, maybe I could have been doing corporate two that's years okay. earlier. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I heard something recently that really helped me kind of put that into perspective a little bit. And that was always assume good intent. And so I have a hard time delegating, <laughs> yes. you know, letting go of things and letting other people do it. And um, so the thing that helped me or is helping me is the fact that I'm just going to assume always good intent. I'm always going to assume that. And if the situation or that person decides to show me something different, then, then I'll deal with it then. But otherwise I'm always going to assume that if, you know, uh, there, there's always good intent. Right. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how else to, it just helped me kind of like, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. I should be assuming good intent. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. not, not that they're going to go off and, you know, screw me because, you know, right. I'm giving this task to them. Right. 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 <laughs> not well, get I it done. Also, right. <laughs> I also think like, here's another thing is a little bit being humble, right? Like I think, Oh, nobody can do that as good as I can. Well, that's not true. You know, there's a lot of people who can do things just as good, if not better. Yeah. And I can do that. And so realizing where your weaknesses are, or even if you're, you're things that you just don't want to do, and then saying there are people that want to support you and can do this and can make your life better because they can do it better. Um, I've actually been talking to um, a virtual assistant. That's one of the things I've been exploring recently. And the, the quickness of the completion of the tasks is like mind blowing. Right. And it's like, why did I think that somebody couldn't do that? And like, and they're doing it way better, you know, like it's, yeah, you'd have to get over yourself too a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Uh, the last question is, uh, your most inspirational, uh, best worst wedding story that you have for me. Well, you know, this gets asked a lot, you know, I always, if people always say, Oh, what's the, like, what are the horror stories? Of, like the, I don't care wedding? about the horror stories as much. I just like, I bring that up because sometimes people like to talk about the horror stories. I really like the more inspirational ones, but so whatever you want to. I, I, I really feel that the, every wedding for me really is like so rewarding that there's like, for me, the inspiration comes from hearing, like at my first wedding was 10 years ago with my company and they just messaged me not that long ago, just to reach out because they were thinking about during this time, like small businesses and the event industry. And they said, you know what, like our wedding was one of the best days of our life. You know, like we were so happy to have you and like, I made a real difference in their life, you know? And sometimes I think, oh, you just plan parties or whatever, but like, no, you're actually making like a real memory for people. And it's not just yeah. like hyperbole or lip service. And so 
for me, like every time I get maybe frustrated or, or down or stressed, like that's what I do is I go back to like the, my clients who will text me things like that or send me an email or, you know, one of them sends me like these crazy, I love watches. So um, she will send me, she'll be like in Barcelona and she'll send me a picture of a watch and she'll be like, I thought you would like this one, you know? And so it's like the relationships and those memories. And that's like really what keeps me going. And, you know, and then really what's come very clear to me in the last year is that weddings are a time for families to come together. And as you get older, you start to lose loved ones. Yep. And then, then those memories and those photos and the video and all of that from the wedding where everyone is gathered. I, my, my stepdad passed away about a year ago. And so, you know, I'm looking at pictures from our wedding and I'm just like, oh, you know, and watching video yeah. from on the dance floor. And so it's just like being a part of that and understanding that and like that's what's inspirational to me i i have a friend who she's a planner in chicago and the mother of the bride was diagnosed with stage four cancer and they moved the wedding date up so that she could be there and she passed away i think like four weeks later wow. i mean and that's the power of what that's the power of what we do and that's the inspiration is like the 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 lasting legacy of yep of the work, you know? So yeah, I agree. I agree. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> it's uh, better than a horror story any day. <laughs> I, absolutely. That's why I said I like I like the more inspirational ones. So um, you know, it's just it feels good and you know, makes you happy. So yeah. Yeah. Um Gretchen, thanks so much for doing this. Really yeah, appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Have a great weekend. Thanks. You too. Bye bye.